Hello and welcome to another segment in this year's Ludo Naricon. I am Austin Walker, the IP director over at Possibility Space and a co-founder and GM uh, of Friends at the Table, an actual play podcast. And joining me today to talk about the newly released and apparently very successful <laughs> Citizen Sleeper is Gareth Damien Martin. Welcome, Gareth. Thank you. Yeah, I'm very happy to to be here as a fan of friends at the table and yeah i'm i'm <laughs> gonna be trying it. to interview i'm gonna be trying to interview you we'll just have to interview each other a little bit we'll go back and forth um yeah but i don't have a new project to announce or anything right now and you have one that just hit hit uh, digital store shelves uh so so can you give me an intro on you and a little bit on citizen sleeper for people who who aren't familiar yet yeah sure so yeah i'm i'm a game developer and um used to be a games critic and i'm the developer of in other waters, which you, is, you know, people may have heard of before, and then yeah, maker of uh, Citizen Sleeper, along with uh, the composer Amos Roddy and the character artist uh, Guillaume Singelin. And uh, Citizen Sleeper is a game where you play as a human consciousness in an artificial body, trying to survive on a space station at the edge of a far future interstellar capitalist society, um, and it's based on ideas taken from tabletop RPGs, so specifically really clocks and dice. And it's a game about trying to make ends meet um, in an environment that is uh, partially derelict, partially falling apart, partially becoming something new, is in a state of transition between um, regimes, between states, um, and I guess you as a character are kind of in a a state of transition between um, having once been a, a real human and now being a human in an artificial body, and are you still a human or not? And uh, yeah, but it's a game where you wake up every morning and you roll a set of dice, and then you decide what you're going to do with those dice. Um, yeah, I was and... explaining the basic structure of it to um, Janine Hawkins, who's from Friends at the Table, last night, and I was like, I really... Like I was trying, to, I was going to get deep into the narrative stuff. Hey, you are human consciousness. You're in kind of an android body. There's this whole backstory. And I was like, okay, wait. Let me explain a different way. You wake up every morning and you're a little bit more hungry, and your body is falling apart. And the and you only have uh, as as much in you that day as your body will let you have. And you never really know how much your body is going to give you. Um, you know, for people who haven't played to this in Sleeper yet. At the most, you get kind of five things you can do at any day. Uh, each is represented by a, a dice that gets rolled or die that gets rolled at the beginning of every day. Uh, and there are a bunch of opportunities around this kind of space station map. Um, and you can kind of zoom in on them and then place that, that die into the slot in order to produce uh, a chance of a positive, neutral, or negative effect based on how good that, that die is and what your luck is. Um, and like, I think immediately I was really captivated by that, by that kind of mechanical metaphor we, obviously there are other games that kind of work in that way i think tharsis is one that comes to mind for me yeah. which is also kind of a a game about <laughs> solely actually i think tharsis is a game about quickly dying in space yeah. in yeah. a much different way um uh but also worker placement games and lots of board games have had similar things um but that core mechanic here is so fascinating to me because it communicates a lot about what your position is on the eye, which is the space station uh, that you're on. Uh, and it never really goes away. Even, you know, uh, at this point, I've seen a couple of endings. I'm towards the end of my time with the game, I think. Um, and I'm pretty stable in terms of, like, being able to meet my needs. Um, but that doesn't mean you have to stop doing those things. And so, and so I'm curious if you can talk a little bit about what went into that decision, the decision of, like, you're never going to reach a point where you literally never stop doing the upkeep. You always have to do the upkeep. Yeah, I mean, I guess I have to start with kind of where that design emerges from for me, um, because that's kind of where the game comes from in a way. I think the, the game so strongly comes from um, me wanting to make a game about the experience of working uh, gig work, which is something that mm. I did straight after the university and i had a lot of zero hours contracts i had a zero hours contract with employment agencies and they do things where they'd be like they'd phone me up uh, at 9 a.m or whatever and they'd be like you're going to be at a bar at um <laughs> eight eight and you're going to work till three and you have never been to this bar before and you're going to meet people there you you know we're going to give you the minimum brief and you're going to rock up and when you rock up there people are like 
who are you? And you're like, oh, they, they told me to come here. And then, um, and that's how you, and you know, sometimes you get work, sometimes you get enough work to make enough money to make rent. And sometimes you don't get enough work. Sometimes you don't. Yeah. And yeah. Sometimes things and, show up and throw you off your game because, you know, so a bill collector shows up uh, yep. in the case of citizen sleeper, or, uh, you know, you run into somebody who has their own problems and you've decided I should prioritize them for a little bit because like, I'm, I'm not stable yet, but I'm like, I know where my next rent check is coming from. I don't know where the one yeah, after right. that is coming from, but I got a little wiggle here. Yeah. Um, like when, you know, if you've got a shift yeah. coming up and a friend phones you up and they say, I, I need you right now. I need some backup. I need something from you. Then you have to make a call in that moment. Right. Like that's how we decide in our lives. And I, to me, yeah, I, I, I've, re I've wanted to make a game about that for a long time. And after in other waters came out and I had success with that game, I thought, okay, this is, I've got a chance here. I've got the mm -hmm. possibility. I'm f I can be a full-time game developer. I've got a chance to make the game I want to make. And the game I want to make is a game about that experience that's so mm -hmm. important to me. And also, you know, we took, you said like, you know, things which can come up. The, the other thing for me is, is that, um, you know, my whole life I've, I've suffered from clinical depression and that idea of kind of waking up every morning and not knowing how you're going to be able to face the day or how, or what, what state you're going to be in when you yeah. open your eyes, are you going to be in the state where you, you've got energy? Are you, you know, are you going to actually be almost like you have too much energy? You're going to have like right. five sixes and you're like, I don't even know what to do with this is a waste this, right? today. Actually, I don't have <laughs> yeah. the projects to spend these exactly. on right now. Yeah. Nobody's totally. calling me up to give me shifts. Um, <laughs> <laughs> totally. Well, like, yeah. Or do uh, you wake up with a handful of ones? It's like, oh, what am I doing with all this energy? I'm wasting it by working minimum wage today, actually. And that job's going to exhaust me just the same as if it was really fulfilling work, right? And in Citizen Sleeper, that's like, yeah, I can go haul scrap today, but I really wish I could put this six into gardening. But I don't, but the gardeners don't want me today, or, you know, they're all the way over there and I don't get access. And I think, you know, I think that there are ways in which, um, as a critic, thinking about writing about this game, I'm not a working critic anymore. I left Waypoint last year. Uh, but I, one of the things I'd be very careful about doing is falling into the trap of only talking about the game as a metaphor for late capitalism and precarity and all these other things, all of which is true about it. But I think I, it's also worth just saying that like I think it's a good game about juggling. I think it's a good game about prioritization, and it's a good game about like um, figuring out what to do with what you got uh beyond the and uh, for me that second step is and it turns out it's also saying a lot about different types of marginalization um uh, because i think yeah. that there are, there are people for whom they they might hear us talk and be afraid that it's a didactic story that is like a lecture on something and i think what works for me about the prose is how grounded so much of it is can you talk about the characters of the eye um you, actually let's just yeah. talk about the eye and how you you first meet it uh, and how you first in, are introduced to the space station. And then from there, I'd love to hear a little about how you kind of represented that history and some of the characters you meet there. Yeah. So, so the I is a, a corporate or was a corporate station. It was a station that was kind of a company town. It was set up in, in, in the universe of Citizen Sleepy, you kind of have these, the, the thing we kind of gesture at and it, don't get too much into, but the idea is there's kind of these, there's the core systems and there's the surrogate systems mm -hmm. and the surrogate systems feed the core system. So the core systems are where the, the resources are spent and where things are built and where people live, uh, you know, with, and we don't get to look at what, what those people's lives are like, but I'm interested in the, the, the edge of that structure and the, the periphery of that structure is, is uh, the surrogate systems. Um, and they are the ones that, that gather resources to send into that, that core is kind of like the basic world building concept. And so um, the I, which was originally um, Ash One, was a Solheim station that was built there as a company town to harvest palladium. Um, but it was ran kind of like, a, yeah, like people could like sign up to go work there and then they would, they would be given a ship and they could go and mine they could do work and they could you know they get paid but then they could only ever live on the station and so mm -hmm. they would pay back all their their income into the company and that's kind of what was there and there was while that was happening a, a union was attempted to be set up by um someone called andre erlin and that character kind of um when solheim there's a yeah i won't get into all the yeah, details but like yeah but we Basically, live in the descent Solheim, of that, right? Solheim like... as a company collapses. And uh, in the chaos that ensues, uh, Erlin's union emerges as one of the major forces on the station. And then, you know, we're here decades later looking at this station where 
the the union has now turned into a kind of institution in in of itself. Mm -hmm. It's now no longer a, a reactive union, and it's now actually a, a, an embedded institution, which is Havenage. Uh, there's other groups. There's a, a, a refugee group um, who are called by some people a gang in the game. Yatagan. There are some other groups working on the station, and you kind of emerge into this as a as someone who's who's never been here before. Um, into this contested territory that is kind of both in the process of being rebuilt and also falling apart because it was damaged very heavily when the company collapsed. Um, and so there are parts of it that work, parts of it that don't. Uh, there's a whole section of it that used to be kind of gardens and farms and is now kind of decaying, but it's also somehow surviving. And there's a there's people who are trying to make life work there. There are other people trying to make life work in different ways. Um, and yeah, the whole structure is is um, is precarious. It's it's on the edge, and it's very um, inspired by this idea of of capitalist ruins, which is um, something that I, I draw from a from a book that I maybe we'll get into later. But yeah. this because let's just jump into it right. all at once. But um, but this idea that you know a ruin is not um, is not something which has been eliminated completely from from mm -hmm. reality it's something where sometimes there's a structure and sometimes there's a gap sometimes there's half a structure sometimes there's a structure that's falling down and sometimes there's something that can be repaired and so okay. capitalist ruins for me in the context of the eye means a space where capitalism once was uh, in full control and now where we have some capitalist structures we have other structures emerging and we have people who are really exposed to the the the, the precarious feeling of being in a ruin right something which is not stable there's also that sense of like the you're in a place that was built for a particular mode of being for capitalism to function and it's as if the structure itself is haunting the people in it because it it, it reproduces certain power relationships and behaviors very quickly um you know one of the first things i think i was thinking about earlier when you were describing your time with gig work was thinking about times when i had jobs where i felt like i was being surveilled uh by supervisors and working with people who were whose jobs were to watch me and not to do work um and uh one of the first characters you end up working with uh is someone who becomes uh, who who on one hand gives you an opportunity and a very bad place to live but a place to, to live um and very quickly that relationship can become complicated as there is it is it is built on the back of uh, uh the belief that you should be being you should be doing basically what you're told and have kind of a short leash and then if you try to elbow out and find out more about yourself and what your place in this in this uh, uh kind of sp space station is uh you can very quickly turn that person against you and feel like you're left out in the woods at, during a time when at least for my for, for my playthrough lots of other things are already collapsing and it was like oh my god but this is the one thing i can count on for income and now it's gone um and i think that that relationship along with some of the other stories that do pop up uh around the ways in which not just a particular corporation but that sort of corporate structure uh, and vertical hierarchy continues to reform itself in these places. Um, it, it's, it's you know, Virilio, of course, says when you build the ship, you build the shipwreck. And it's like, when you build the identification system, you build a system through which you can identify and separate people and catalog people. And if you think that that system isn't going to be used in some way down the road, in which it does in fact divide people into haves and have nots or people who get access to something or who are even considered to get access for something, you're fooling yourself. Um, uh, and so I, I really appreciate how that stuff comes comes uh, to bear, but mostly it comes to bear through the use of just characters who are like, hey, this is a strugg struggling single dad. Hey, this is someone who's trying to get a restaurant off the ground. Uh, you know, actually there's like a lot of restaurant tours in this game. Lots of people are cooking in this game all the time. Um, here's like a delivery service. And I think that really breeds a lot of life into that sense of like, this is a community where everyone's just trying to get by. You people playing dominoes or some future version of a kind of quick table game. It's, it's actually a dice game, isn't it? Uh, yeah, so it's basically backgammon. I think is the, gotcha. the idea, okay. right? That makes sense. Yeah. Who's your of these characters that that are are available and they're kind of plots to follow? Who stands out for you as one of your favorites? Mm, it's difficult. Um, I you know it's the process of writing them was such a process of kind of digging people up that I know. Also mm -hmm. thinking about structures that I've experienced, and then also like giving 
bits of text and, and references to Guillaume and then him sending me back these incredible uh -huh. drawings and then me being like, oh, I have to make this character even better because I have to live up to the art. Um, and I think like the first piece of art that, that Guillaume did was for Emphis. Um, sure. And speaking I, of yeah, cooks and restaurants, yeah. Yeah, and people, I mean, Emphis was there from the start. I knew immediately I wanted to have a street food uh, vendor and um, I, w I wanted to have somebody who was interested in food and stories um, because I always think there's like a, I don't know, maybe it's just a thing, but I just think there's some kind of connection between, um, yeah, between telling each other stories and also eating together and this kind of, and I, I wanted to have a character that was about that. And yeah, he, he sat around for a, a, a while and kind of, I, I built him out and um, kind of, yeah, there's, it, it, with everybody, I wanted them to have a reason why they were there and their own experience of precarity. And I, I wanted to use everybody as a way of exploring. I mean, you said earlier, like didactic, and I think if, you know, the game has been kind of accused a, a little bit of being didactic. But I think that I would like to think of it as being discursive in that mm. sense, you know, that I'm, I'm actually... For, for in other words, I had a post-it note stuck up that said symbiosis on it. And every time I had a question, the answer was on the post-it. For right. this game, the, the, the word was precarity. And the, the answer was always precarity. And precarity is not a, a solution. It's a condition. Right. Um, and so I was interested in exploring this condition. Um, and so some of the characters can be didactic, right? Feng is, is didactic. And I love Feng for that because Feng is an idealist. And so yeah. he's another character I really enjoy. And I enjoyed writing Feng. Um, and kind of like exploring this idea of somebody who connects to the union and has this history with the union, but also kind of sees that the revolution had its problems and maybe isn't even a, a revolution. It's a kind of so-called revolution or, you know, the, the people in power somehow stayed or these kind of, these kind of structures. So, and, and yeah, but a lot of this all draws from a lot of experiences I have and, and, you know, ideas around Feng and the revolution actually come from, um, my partner who's Romanian and, and my time speaking with her parents and her family and people in Romania and how they felt about the, the revolution in 89 um, and how power transmitted over that. Right. And so, yeah, I, you know, I, I created myself a, um, a space into which I could put all the things that I'm really, really <laughs> interested in exploring, not necessarily that I have answers for, but things right. that I think are super interesting about about precarity about urban spaces about the the hierarchies and the stories and and how they layer up um, One of the things I, oh, ahead, yeah. finish. please finish your thought no i was just gonna i was just gonna say that i also you know i have a special love actually for ethan despite ethan being like a a total shithead really <laughs> i mean well like um, ethan and emphis to me are interesting responses to something one of the things i want to ask you about is is this a is this a cyberpunk game? What's the relationship to cyberpunk? And I think that there's a really important swap or something that happens with both Ethan, who is a bounty hunter, uh, uh, who kind of coming for you because you are an escaped corporate asset, uh, and Emphis, who is your like quintessential cyberpunk blade runnery uh, uh, street food vendor. Except that Emphis is also a character and is given is not just backdrop and has. Uh, an important story to tell and and can reveal more about like you said the precarity of some people in this in this setting um and ethan is like deckard except the movie understands what a piece of shit he is um and uh and so i i really want to know what, what what you think citizen sleepers relationship is to like these kind of core canonical quote unquote uh uh cyberpunk texts and and if that's a genre space you find that you're comfortable in or interested in or engaging in what is your discursive, discursive relationship with cyberpunk via yeah. Citizen sleeper i mean i'm really I, I love that observation about emphasis and um and ethan there because yeah i think that in a way like does point to the fact that my relationship with a lot of sci-fi actually and cyberpunk particularly is like i am I, I find myself like trying to look over the shoulder of the the detective to the to the guy running the ramen store, right? Because I'm, I care more about what's happening over there than I do actually about the the kind of rain-soaked monologue that's happening in, in the foreground. And, I, you know, it's the same in Star Wars, right? I'm much more interested right. in, like, the, the the markets and, like, what's happening than I am interested in in the Jedi. Or And so that's just my, my tendency naturally. But then I think also, for me, um, like, I love, I deeply love uh, William Gibson's Sprawl trilogy, but I don't, deeply love them as cyberpunk books or at least yeah. like i i had this idea in my head a while ago and i think citizen sleeper is kind of it's my interpretation of it it's like could you adapt a william gibson book without um 
uh, without somehow making something cyberpunk or like what happens if you try to bring the qualities the things that i was seeing in gibson and saying like i love that so especially like count zero there's mm -hmm. this sequence with um the count who's like this a uh, rubbish uh, hacker who like gets involved in something bigger than him and he's uh, he's looking over New Jersey he's walking through New Jersey and he's yeah. talking about the different gangs and the people on the street and all of the things all the business all the business is happening around him and how he sees it and I think that is the side of Gibson I really love where you have these characters who are really implicated in a lot of things and you have all of these systems that are um, that are exposed and these characters are, are, are struggling against something and I like it because I related to it instantly. I was like, yeah, I, you know, I know that feeling of walking through a city and kind of like picking up on the, the what's happening and, and feeling connected to it and scared of it, but also excited by it. Um, and so that was something I really wanted to, to bring from Gibson. But yeah, is that is that cyberpunk? I don't know. And <laughs> like you say, Ethan, I mean, it probably is, right? This game is ultimately halfway through. We stuck a type of cyberpunk tag on it in Steam because I was like, okay, we well, you we get more than you pretending. right? <laughs> uh, like uh, people who people who like cyberpunk stories will probably like this one and find something to relate to, or at least you hope that they that yeah they will. But but Ethan, yeah, Ethan was specifically designed by me to be. What does Deckard? What does what does any of these? What does the main character of Cyberpunk twenty seventy seven look like from the other end of the gun? You know, like right. they they're an asinine, like horrible, um, like yeah, like they're just it's just nasty and like so I was just like okay, but who's this character? But the thing with Ethan is he started off there and then Guillaume did such amazing art that I was like, God, this guy is he's kind of hot and he's kind of yeah. like interesting. And then he reminded me of all the people in my life that were were, were bad news, but I was attracted to or yep. like drawn to. And so then I was like, okay, that this is yeah. this no. Guy. I was like, oh wow, uh, all of the villain fuckers are just gonna eat this guy <laughs> up. Like he's so he's so bad at his job at a certain point, also. Um, and the moment that the power dynamic shifts is like deeply is just choice. Uh, there is a there there are, without getting into deep spoilers about it. Um, being able to see that character high and low is is extremely rewarding, um, and the way things end up breaking or did for me was um, was fulfilling in many different ways. <laughs> uh, I, I, to hit on something that you just that you just touched on too, um, that sense of you're a person in a place like Count Zero. It also reminds me a lot of I don't know if you've read uh, the Star Fraction by Ken McLeod, but I'm going to recommend mm -hmm. that you go the the. Uh, the Star Fraction is part of a four or three part uh, series of books, um, depending on how you count, uh, by a Scottish uh, sci-fi writer named Ken McLeod um, uh, that I think you get a lot out of. So shout outs, shout outs to, to that. Um, and it similarly is a, is a world in which there are lots of moving parts and the core players are kind of soaking in what those the relationships are between, you know, uh, biotech corporations and you know uh, one of the main characters is part of an, a, a, a Trotskyist mercenary group right uh, like basically a group of shadow runners uh, who is explicitly Trotskyist which is like opening up a whole can of worms but it's dealt <laughs> with in some very fun like another major character is part of a um, a sort of like what if Amazon was a Mormon corp was an explicitly <laughs> Mormon corporation wow uh, fascinating series um, uh, but that has that similar sense of like all of these threads and all of this world building and the characters coming coming to them. And the thing I love the most about the narrative design, most is strong. The thing I like a lot about the narrative design of Citizen Sleeper is realize that these threads do interweave, um, sometimes in soft ways. There's a sort of soft linearity uh, in which there are, are concepts and ideas that get presented early on in the sorts of stories that you're likely to pursue because they're a little bit safer. Um, and then there's yeah. also... Uh, uh, a sort of soft linearity or easy linearity uh, around certain uh, threads literally crossing in surprising ways. Uh, and I'm curious if you can talk to us a little bit about the way in which you set out to tell some linear stories despite making it feel, feel like there are there's an overwhelming amount of options in some moments. Like, okay, I can go follow this thread and this thread and this thread. How did you, how did you focus players' attention when you did want to do that? Yeah, I mean, this is kind of comes down to a big structural question that the game tries to answer or tries to deal with, which is the idea of like, how do I 
translate a tabletop experience in an interesting way into a, a video game because we've got the dice uh, which we've talked about and and but actually we've also got the clocks which um i from which i really take from blades in the dark and i i love and i love the sense of threat you can get from just introducing a clock and you know you have the hunted clock um and so i think that for me that kind of narrative structure of of linearity which it is fairly linear is down to the way in which i noticed that i um igm games which is that in a way like that there are threads that are, there are threads all running uh, parallel and the player can kind of intervene and touch on them but that in a way like and they can affect them but in a way like those threads it's not like necessarily as big a possibility space as people sometimes imagine right like which is i think sometimes what people sometimes try to do when recreating like tabletop experiences in games and that's you know that i think there's really valid versions of that right well the myth goes like deep into the kind of proceduralism mm -hmm. but because what i'm making is something like a I guess a quote unquote small RPG, something that's very focused on on a, almost a single theme, then I, I want to kind of like have all of these different possibilities for the player, for them to enter into and drop in and out of. Um, but it's not, it, I didn't want to make it just like a free choice. And, and also on the secondary level, I, I'm not a big fan of dialogue choices being the choices you make. Cause I, that just, when I started to try to make a game about precarity in life it's like well we don't we never make dialogue choices in life i don't tell my friend like get lost or i love you you know like i don't i don't paragon or renegade yeah. people i i you know i turn up or i don't turn up right like i when when that friend phones me up and says i need your help and you're like i've got a shift you you do the shift or you see your friend that's right. the choice and it it so the i wanted the choice to be about the dice and so the kind of narrative structure went on from there because I, I also, yeah, I could spend seven years like building every possibility into this narrative structure, but I wanted to make something that felt um, tight and and was, yeah, lightweight in a way and kind of played to those advantages of tabletop storytelling where it's like, I'm going to throw stuff at you and um, I'm going to throw a lot of ideas at you and then it's up to you to decide like, oh, do, am I interested in these ideas? Am I interested in this character? Just like mm -hmm. almost do like a gut check and say like, oh, I really like this street food vendor i really need to know i need to know what that person is about um or like oh i really don't trust dragosh like dragosh he's not a good guy I, i'm not going to get him out of his debt situation like i want to get as far away from him as possible uh -huh. you know i i wanted people to really just gut check and go for stuff and it but it, yeah it's a tricky it's a tricky design thing that's why the drives are also there to try and yeah. help players be selective um about what what kind of quests they do and trying to like break people out of the idea of like rinsing all the quests. Um, and I don't know how successful I am because I think some people also like just want to see more and more content. They want to so see it all. Yeah. 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 At the end totally. of the day. I get that in a sense. I, the way I am playing it, there are there have been opportunities to wrap up my story. Um, and I would say that I'm making the decision not to wrap it up those places because I genuinely don't want to wrap it up yet, or because I genuinely don't think those are decisions my character wants to make. I think my yeah. character is uh, very tied to certain groups on the eye and like wants to like can't imagine leaving all those groups behind at this point, right? Um, but uh, but even me as someone who's like, ooh, I'm into experimental narrative stuff. There is that tick of like, ooh, I don't want to close the door on all these other potential stories. And obviously, I could replay. I could start a new character. I could I could start from the jump again. Um, but I but I do get that that response from some people. I, I can't hold it against them too much in this case because I think the prose is good and the, the world building is good. So it's like, you know, you, people want to have their time with the game. Um, I have a, I, I have a sort of, it's not a double question. I think the, the question I want to ask you is built on an assumption and I think it's a quick one. So let's just say this game games are political. We're all agreed here. Games tell political stories, whether they intend to or not. The deeper, more interesting question for me is there are things about this game regarding what I just was just talking about the idea that you could kind of wrap up a story with a, with an NPC and, and get a, a credit sequence and end the game there because you've made a certain permanent decision about your character's future, um, which is kind of a structural spoiler, but it's, uh, you think you can hit one pretty quickly. And so I don't want to, I'm going to say it. And I think this question is important. Um, so there, in some ways, what the player is being given is a lot of opportunities to define what they think, what define their own priorities and pick a route that feels true to them. Um, and those endings all say something kind of political 
uh, indirectly about what your relationship is to community, uh, what your responsibility is to others, um, your desire to be uh, to, to trade kind of self care for communal living or communal communal safety. All of those sorts of things are are left pretty open in terms of player choice. The design also has stuff that's not open at all. Um, there's something I really like. We already talked about this that like you never become so stable that you don't have to do the maintenance. And to the degree that this is a game about precarity it's and, and like capitalism, it's also a game about being marginalized in, in yeah, under late capitalism. Um, you're constantly called sleeper and you are visually marginalized uh, and racialized because of what your body looks like. Um, you are, uh, you have just, you are disabled, you are disabled and medicalized and have a chronic condition that needs constant upkeep through medical technologies uh, or through practices that, you know, uh, emerge as you come to learn how your own body works. Um, uh, and, and you are obviously classed because of the need to just constantly uh, find places to live <laughs> and keep, keep uh, food in your belly and, and a roof over your head. Um, and those are hard truths about this game. You, you, there is never a choice to stop being racialized in this game or to stop yeah. being disabled in this game. You can find stability as a disabled person. You can find um, uh, ways to maintain yourself that are, that are reliable and stockpile emergency supplies for when things go bad and all of that's great. But that's a hard thing that you've said, which is a different tack than what you take with the sort of ending plot lines, which, uh, which give that sort of flexibility. And I'm curious where you draw that line or how you what you decide is something you want to leave up to the player versus something you think is something you want to hard code into the design structure. Yeah. I mean, I guess that the, the position of the sleeper is in a way like the kind of core premise for the game. For me, the core thing that I want to, I want to personally explore. And it's both as a thing that, relates to my experiences of yeah of mental health and and also you know i i came out as non-binary during the development of this game um and uh you know the, there are kind of elements of of gender dysphoria and sure. um other yeah like the idea of a body which is not your own i, I it's also but also like extreme depersonalization um i think like a, a broad swath of things that um that i have experienced but then equally, yeah, you're right. There's a positional element to that, right? Like a political positional element to that, which is also about, yeah, what I'm asking the player to be or, or where I'm asking them to to stand. Um, but I, I, yeah, I, I'm really focused on wanting to, yeah, wanting to put the player in a place that to me felt like a place that science fiction stories don't usually put their protagonists um in general and where but where i felt i think i was i was very inspired by the game diaries of a spaceport janity years ago when i played it because i played that game and i was like oh you can you can do like star wars essentially like you can do this kind of like crazy spaceport full of like exciting things and you can also like replicate this experience of being marginalized and and you can you can replicate um precarity and you can do it in a way that's playful but also really impactful and i found that game to relate very strongly to me and i i, I yeah and i just like that it i want to do that i want them i don't want one or the other i don't yeah. think um i don't think i should be forced to choose between uh, doing something realistic and doing science fiction which i love and i you know i i want to and I don't want to wait around for somebody bigger than me to to give me permission to tell that story. So my interest is in yeah, is in telling that story. So I yeah, in a way, it's very instinctive that kind of like positioning of the sleeper. But in terms of the choice of the endings, um, I yeah, those were those were funny because when I wrote them, I was I wrote the first one and I wrote the first ending choice, and I was like, that's the one. That's the that's the end. That's the ending I want people to choose. And they wrote the next one. I was like, no, that's the ending I want people <laughs> to choose. And then they really, they became incredibly, they're very, oh, they're very raw for me. The writing those ending was really rough. And um, because they're, yeah, some of them are quite final and some of them really relate to very hard things. There's one which is, a, is about kind of um, the idea of disappearing from being a human or giving up on 
and that that was incredibly rough to write to the point where I thought like I I don't think I can put this in the game. I walked I kinda... very far down that and was like, I'm gonna close the game and go the other way because I want to hold on to this other thing. Still yeah, at the end of but the I, day. But I wanted to. I also wanted to make sure when I wrote that ending, I wanted to make sure that I didn't want players to feel like if they did choose to leave, right, that that was not that I was gonna say to them that you were not right. And I like I have I, I have experiences which are very close to that. And I've been in that position as a person. And I I really wanted to respect people. And so, yeah, all of, but all mm -hmm. of those endings are like that. The, the endings which are about choosing family for me, uh, I, I'm I'm a, a father and, I, you know, I'm, I'm very, um, the, the three, <laughs> there's this whole thing about the three body problem that comes up in one of the endings and like the idea of how we affect each other. And it, especially like a lot of the endings are about our relationship to systems and what, what can we say when something is... Um, how can we respond when something is so big it could crush us without yeah. even noticing that it crushed us? How do we respond? How do we continue to live? Because that's the position that the sleeper is in. But in a way, like we we all are in in that position. We I don't think there's any of us that are free of a system that that could just unthinkingly um, destroy us in a moment. So you know wh whether we want to accept it or not, that's 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 how things work. And so yeah, I, I guess I wanted to allow players to to kind of like answer me, I guess. Like I didn't want to give them an answer. Are you, are you, uh, are you like an evil mega corporation tracking uh, player data? And <laughs> yeah, no, I'm not. Yeah, that would be very ironic. Um, <laughs> yeah, no. I mean, I, 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 I would, it would be one of those things that the curi I would forgive you for the curiosity, <laughs> even if I would be opposed to it morally. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, it's probably would be fine, but I, I yeah, I don't know. I'm curious. I'm I'm so excited by the fact that a lot of people said that they decided not to do all the endings and now they're just on the eye. I find that very exciting because in a way, like I didn't actually expect that. I expected that. And so in a way I feel like I'm slightly, slightly like surprised by that, but I kind of love it because part of me also says that like the choice of staying to on the eye and being uh, part of something is yeah is like the is something that i would choose or like just holding on but that's also because i i live in the city of this london same like I'm and, and like everybody london. leaves it's a right. temporary place uh, this is one of my favorite you mentioned diaries of spaceport janitor and i think my one of my favorite things about that game is the first time there's like a festival day or it's like whatever the, the kind of like weekend equivalent is and the music is just like echoing through the entire city and you're broke but you're like, ah, oh, this is the best place in the world. Why would I live anywhere else? Like that is what it is to, to live in a city that you love um, is, is that bad. And I think that the eye captures this for me where it's like, yeah, this place sucks. And also it's where I live. It's my home. Like, and I think that that is, is uh, I have a deep city bias uh, like you. And I think that that, that is reflected in the way that I relate to it. And the endings actually remind me to speaking of, of other games, um, the endings remind me of Heaven Will Be Mine um, by Worst Girl Games, which similarly have uh, big endings about what comes next um, uh, that are opposed in many ways, but fundamentally believe in change um, that like the status quo will not stand. Uh, and then obviously, because I've just been playing it a lot as Elden Ring, similarly, surprisingly, had more than just two endings this time that were basically do it again or walk into the dark it was like five versions of walk into the dark what comes next cannot be what is here um uh and what i like about about citizen sleeper i, I i'm not going to talk about the stay on the eye um non-ending that you're talking about players who just like all right i'm here now i'm still here um but there is a sort of ending there and it's being able to be here in a different way than you were at the beginning of the game Right. Yeah. Um, and I think that that means something. I think the transformation of the way you interact with things and the way you the the way in which I said it already earlier, by the end of the game, you might know where your medicine is coming from. You might have you, you might have built a community. I mean, this is like part of what I feel like the game answers is like, how do you solve precarity? And it's like you come together with the people around yeah. you and you solve each other's needs and you realize that like, hey, I have two of what I need and one of what somebody else needs. I'll trade that one away or I'll give that one away in order to, to help knit this community closer together. Um, and I think that that's, that's a, a really uh, good place to be uh, you know, in a game like this. And it separates it, I think, from a lot of very cynical cyberpunk stories insofar as cyberpunk at all. We only have like five minutes left. We haven't talked about tabletop games. No, Besides Sega Blades in the Dark and Clocks a few times. 
Can we talk about tabletop games? Yeah, yeah. Let's not talk more about Cyberpunk. It's okay. okay. We, we just say that this is maybe, may or may not be Cyberpunk. May or may not be. It's definitely a tabletop role playing game in some form. Do you have you have you run it? Have you run Citizen Sleeper as a table? Have you run the Eye as like a location in a Cyberpunk or God in a tabletop game? Oh, I ran a very similar location for a different game. Um, I, I did a test kind of uh, a test run where yeah, I had this location where there were like lots of threads running at the same time, and like it was there was like a it was like this big um spaceship um i ran it for my little brother i actually i can never find enough people so i'm always just running games for one person i think that's why i ended up making citizen sleeper but Mm -hmm. um it yeah it's this like spaceship that's been kind of grounded and it's like a contested territory and there's like an arms deal and there's different gangs and all i said to the player was like you have to find this person of interest and then it was like I was running all these like background clocks to kind of like decide w- what was progressing at different points. And yeah, that was kind of like a design test. But I also made a pen and like a, a, a paper prototype for Citizen Sleeper just using like stacks of index cards. And then mm-hmm. like as you assign dice to them, you could take like a card away. And yeah, and maybe, I, you know, I just recently adapted or began the process of adapting my first game in Other Waters into a, a mothership module cool. um, with uh, in collaboration with Lone Archivist who makes mothership modules. And yeah, I, I'm, yeah, there probably will be some form of Down Citizen Sleeper tabletop content in the future because yeah, I, you know, and you know, it's crazy, actually crazy um we ha- you know to talk to you now at this point in the development because i got into tabletop games um while making in other waters through listening to the marielda oh, awesome. of friends of the table through Thank actual you. play and that's why i started playing blades in the dark and yeah i mean i think that those systems left a big mark on me especially when you're developing a game playing tabletop it's like oh my god you telling me i've been spending all this time building systems that have to function perfectly when what i can do is just get on a zoom call with some people yeah. and just like use, a, it up. use three pages of rules and then just like stuff will emerge that is just like incredible the best world building you could ever find i was like okay this is so much more exciting but can i like how do i put these two things together so that's now my life is now putting it's, trying to put these two things together they have to work right we have to be able to get there and i think the answer to it as like my professional position on this after years of being a game critic and all of that is people have to lower their standards a little bit. And <laughs> what they'll find is that they're way happier. And when I say lower their standards, the thing about a tabletop role-playing game is it's so quick. It's so agile to be able to invent something new on the fly, whether that is a system for doing a t- court trial or an entirely new solution to a problem the GM never thought you would come up with. Um, and then just doing it at low fidelity. You don't need dungeon minis, dungeons and you know uh, dungeon maps and minis uh, every time. Sometimes you just need someone to be like, oh yeah, I'm gonna like take this, uh, this tank is supposed to be a weapon for war, but I'm actually going to do a heist with it. I'm just gonna crash it into the back of this bank, load it up with gold bars, and then like drive it away into the sunset. And you're like, yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, I guess that's a story we can tell. Let's just tell that story. Um, and that freedom comes from everything not needing to look there are action scenes in citizen sleeper yes i never see a gunfight on screen and i don't need to for those to feel tense in a similar way to you know disco elysium has one big fight at the end and that is visually represented um but is uh, i think a deeply powerful thing because it emerges in a game without a combat system in it outside of its core resolution mechanics uh, and i think citizen sleeper is like another step down that road along with a bunch of other stuff like diaries of spaceport janitor like you said the number of other things that are like how can we do more with a little bit less and, and i think that that's really good we have like a minute left do you have any final final thoughts or, or no, things you want to shout yeah. out before we wrap uh the game i mean yeah if this, any of this sounds interesting to people then um, I promise you, it's not. It's 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 also it's also a video game. It's not. It just, is. Uh, it's not. It's not just a said, thesis. Like, it's a, it's like it feels fun to juggle your resources. It feels good to be like, ooh, I got a bunch of sixes to spend today. I'm going to advance a bunch of different plot lines. I'm so stoked to to be able to you know pursue all these different these different ideas and these different like characters that I love and see what their stories end up end up being. Um, uh, yeah. That stuff is is just fantastic on its own, even if it wasn't also hitting this this notion of precarity so hard, which yeah. also just I think does resonate with people right now for no, very I mean, obvious that's, reasons. 
that that is that is you know my feeling is also like it's important to me but i think it's it's part of the generation that i feel a part of right like precarity is is that experience i think there's so many people who know what that means um even if they yeah like who know what this means what it means to feel like you you're struggling against systems bigger than you and you have to build your own small systems or your own little allyships your own mutual aid your own structures uh, that yeah i don't know and that's why the for me the like I, yeah it's about kind of the intimacy also of the game and like making the pros very intimate and very focused on the small textures of things and the, the feelings of things was so important to me throughout development and trying to capture that like put put people there like you say because i don't have I, that's the tool i have i have the okay i have this beautiful art and i have the the music and the sound and i have the station but we never get to go inside and so i needed the pros to bring people in um, and that's what I find very exciting. And I, I will be doing, no one can stop me now. There will be more of all of this because it is an incredible superpower when you realize that you can use the, exactly the same mechanics for babysitting, growing mushrooms, you know, like you say, being a gang enforcer or like you, you can, it, once you yep. do that, you will never go back to wanting to animate like each individual action or build a, a lock picking mini game, you'll just be like, I can tell any story I want um, with this. So yeah, I'm, I'm excited to continue down that path and kind of tr see how many stories I can tell about, about, about this world and this universe and, and, you know, the structures that, that dictated and yeah, I'm, yeah, it's going to be fun. Awesome. Looking forward to seeing what those are. That's going to do it for us. Uh, where can people find you on the internet, Gareth? Uh, so you can find me at, at Jump Over the Age on Twitter, and you can also find the game at, at Citizen Sleeper. Uh, and uh, you can find me on Twitter at Austin underscore Walker. If you're interested in sci-fi stories about about uh, precarity, you should you should listen to the Friends of the Table season. Uh, Counterweight, I think, probably is the closest to Citizen Sleeper. Give that a listen. Uh, I hope you enjoy uh, both of these things that we've made. Yeah, and Partisan is also incredible, so you should listen thank to that. Thank you. I love Yeah, when we're coming up with our, with our sequel to Partisan a little earlier this year. So, yeah. all right. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I'll throw back to whatever the uh, uh, card is that says what's coming up next. I don't have it in front of me. So <laughs> talk to everybody later. Peace. Bye.